Hi everyone, Mr. Graham here. Today I want to go over, well I want to actually take us from the realm of depicting motion by, by using graphs, the graphical depiction of motion, to the algebraic depiction of motion. Um, I always like to think that if you really know a physics concept, you can describe it graphically, you can describe it mathematically, in our case algebraically, and also in words. You should be able to describe the process in words, or the concept in words. So um, the, the physics one, AP physics one equation sheet you now have, have available, it's on, on the module. If you're in face-to-face -face learning, I've given you a copy. Um, and these are the first three equations on that formula sheet. They're called the kinematic equations. Kinematics is just the study of motion, the study of an object's motion without reference to the, the forces that cause that motion. And so what I'm going to do today, you're not going to have to really be able, you're, you're not going to need to be able to regurgitate what I'm going to do today, but very often I get asked by students, where do the equations come from? It's not like scientists just make up these equations from, from nowhere. They don't, just, they don't just pull them out of nowhere. They usually come from, there's usually certain ways of deriving those equations. And there's many ways of deriving the kinematic equations, but since we know motion graphs now, I'm going to go ahead and use our knowledge of motion graphs to derive those kinematic equations. Um, just some things to point out first. Let's, let's list our variables here. Our first variable that we see in kinematic equation number one is V with a subscript X. All this means is final velocity, final velocity, specifically in the X direction. And all that means is that we are talking about motion, motion in the horizontal direction. That's what the subscript X stands for. Um, so all these, all these subscripts that are X's here, we use X's whenever we study motion in the Y direct, in the X direction, but then we will eventually study free fall motion, so motion in the vertical direction, and we'll replace those subscripts with Y's. But on the formula sheet, they are given as X's, okay? Uh, the next symbol we see is V X naught. Remember that naught subscript that I talked about in the previous video? This just means initial velocity. Okay. In the X direction, obviously. Again, if we're talking about vertical motion, then we replace the X with the Y. The A with the subscript X is acceleration. Again, in the X direction. And then T, obviously is going to be time. Um, technically, T stands for delta T, but when we have our subscripts like X naught and V naught, we assume that T naught is zero. And so if we have delta T, that's gonna be final time minus initial time, but if the initial time is zero, then delta T is really just T. So that's why when we use not subscripts, we can just put the T there. We assume that we start our stopwatch at time t equals zero. And the last two symbols we have here are, we'll find them in the second and third kinematic equation. They're just x and x naught. Remember, x naught is our initial position. It is a vector pointing from the origin to wherever the object is located at the start of the motion. And x with no subscript is our final position. So you really need to know what all these variables stand for in order to properly understand how to depict the how to algebraically depict an object's motion. Okay? So go ahead and write these down in your notes, memorize them. You will need to know what they all mean. And I'm going to go ahead and erase though because I'm going to need the board space to derive these equations. All right. And I will be referring as we go throughout our study of kinematics to the equations as kinematic equation number 1, number 2 and number 3. And the first one I'm going to derive is going to be kinematic equation number one. And I will be using something that we're already familiar with. I'm going to be using our velocity versus time graph. So we are dealing with a velocity versus time. And let's say that an object that we're studying the motion of starts with some non-zero velocity. Let's say that at the start of the motion, it starts with some velocity that's not zero. And so we'll all call that our initial velocity, sorry, our initial velocity in the x direction. So let's say this is a car that's just accelerating horizontally, but is already starting with some initial velocity. And let's say after some amount of time, it ends up with some final velocity, vx. And let's say it attains that final velocity at some final t value, t. Which means our initial point on the graph is going to be this one, and our final point will be here. And if the object is undergoing uniform, 
uniformly accelerated motion, then the graph of this object would just be a straight line. And if it continues to accelerate, if the graph will keep going, but we're just gonna we're just gonna talk about the object's motion up until that time t. All right. So now we're gonna I'm, I'm gonna reference something from your math class, something that you learned years ago, and that is the slope-intercept form for the equation of a line. Y equals mx plus b. We've done that for years at this point. Where y is our any y value on the graph. M is our slope. X is the corresponding x value on the graph if we were dealing with an x, y axis, and b is our y intercept. So all I'm going to do to derive kinematic equation number one is replace our math symbols with our physics symbols. And so our y axis variable will be our final velocity. Like, say we're interested in what the velocity is at this point. The y value in math class, well, that's our final velocity value here. So I just put final velocity in the x direction there. Now, m stands for slope. And we should, at this point, know that the slope on a velocity versus time graph is the object's acceleration. Can I spell acceleration? So instead of m, I'm going to go ahead and put the acceleration and if we are dealing in the x direction, then we put a subscript for x. Now our x coordinate, or our x value, on the x axis from your math class is our t axis in our, in our physics class. And so, and so instead of x, I'm going to write t. And then our initial position, or our, 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 uh, our y-intercept in math class b is the y-intercept. Our y-intercept here is just our initial velocity. And if you remember your properties of mathematics, you know that the order in which you add terms in an expression does not matter. So I can rearrange this. I can just swap these guys and put the VX not here and the AXT there. And so I end up with the final velocity equals the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. There's kinematic equation number one. We just used our knowledge of velocity versus time graphs in order to derive that equation. Um, so again, this is kinematic equation number one. It's the easiest one to derive, all right? So hopefully you understood where I went there. Let's go ahead and move on to kinematic equation number two. We are still going to be using our velocity versus time graph. I don't know why I erased that. We're going to use our velocity versus time graph to now derive kinematic equation number two, this one. This one's scary. It looks scary. Most students particu don't particularly like it because it is a quadratic. Remember, our, our x-axis is now represented by a t. I have a term in here with a t squared, a term in here with just a t, and then a constant term. So that's like your, your y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. So um, this is going to be, uh, this is a quadratic equation. Notice it's plotting position and not velocity. And we've seen that under uniformly accelerated motion, our final position um, versus time is actually a parabola. It makes a parabola. And why does it make a parabola? Well, because the equation is a quadratic. It's a parabola itself. Okay. Now, what we learned is that on a velocity versus time graph, the area is the displacement. And in AP Physics 1 and AP Physics C, and if you go on to physics in college, usually we call our displacement in the x direction delta x. That's what we represent. This is displacement. Okay. You'll see d's with your friends in pre-AP and on-level physics, but we don't use d's because we're going to be doing we're going to be doing a little more uh, uh, rigorous physics, and it, it makes sense to really delineate whether we're dealing with the x-direction displacements or the y-direction displacements. So delta x is our displacement, and the area under this graph is the displacement. Now, yes, this is a trapezoid, but if you're like me, you can never, for the life of you, remember the equation for the area of a trapezoid. So what I'm going to do is divide this this area into the area of a triangle and a rectangle and just add them together. So the area of this rectangle is base times height. Well, my base going from zero to t is just t, whatever t happens to be. Remember, it could be any value for an object with any acceleration, but if it's uniform, then, then uh, yeah, it's just going to be t times our height, which is the x naught. Okay, so that's my area of my rectangle. My area of my triangle, one half base times height. So it's going to be one half times the base, which is also t, times the height of the triangle. Now the height of the triangle here is represented by this distance, right? 
And if I want to know, this is essentially your delta y when you're calculating like slopes in your math class, your change in y, but here it's going to be our change in v. And change in v means final velocity minus the initial velocity. Okay. If I want to know what this distance is, I have to take this distance, which is vx, and then subtract this distance, which is vx0, and then I end up with vx minus vx0. And so that is going to be the height of the triangle, Vx minus Vx naught. So now I have these two areas that if I add them together, I will get the, the displacement for this object. And so I'm going to go ahead and write that. I'm going to say my displacement delta x equals the sum of these two areas. So I'll have, and I'm going to go ahead, and you, you should know your properties of multiplication as well at this point. It doesn't matter the order that you add the terms, or that you multiply the terms. So I could put my velocity for the area of the rectangle in front of the t, and I'm going to do that. So I get vx0 times t. Notice we see that term here, vx0 times t, so that's going to stay. And then I must add to that um, 1 half t times vx minus v vx0. So plus 1 half times the time times vx minus vx0. And I'm not being too good about this, but when you write these equations, you should be in your head saying what the variables represent. So if I'm looking at this equation, I'm saying displacement equals initial velocity in the x direction times time plus one half times the time times the difference between the final and initial velocities. Okay. Now this doesn't look like kinematic equation number two, so I gotta I gotta kind of do some manipulations here, some further manipulations. And in order to derive kinematic equation number two, I'm gonna have to bring back kinematic equation number one. So so here. I'm going to leave that alone for now and rewrite kinematic equation number one, which is final velocity in the x direction equals initial velocity in the x direction plus the acceleration in the x direction times time. And then because you're allowed to do anything you want to any equation as long as you follow the rules, I'm going to go ahead and manipulate this. I'm going to subtract my initial velocity from both sides. And so in my next step, I have on the left side final velocity minus initial velocity equals the acceleration in the x direction times the time. Now note that here I have vx minus vx naught equals some other quantity, in this case the acceleration times time, and I also see that here. I see vx minus vx naught. Those of you that are taking the PSAT or the SAT soon, you'll find a lot of the math questions on the SAT will have you solve for equation, solve equations for not just a single variable, but say a product of two variables or a difference or a sum of two variables. Um, and so this is one case where I'm going to solve kinematic equation number one for the difference between these two variables so that it matches here. Because if I do that, then I can substitute this, the product of the acceleration and the time in for that quantity there. And so when I make that substitution, I end up with delta x equals, or the displacement equals initial velocity in the x direction times time plus one half times the time, times, instead of writing this again, I'm gonna write the acceleration in the x direction times time. And notice I have a time and I have a time. So time times time is time squared. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just rewrite this as delta x equals initial velocity in the x direction times time plus one half the acceleration in the x direction times the time squared. This is one way of writing kinematic equation number two, but it is not the way that it's written on the formula sheet. But you really want to be able to talk about displacements in terms of just delta x and also in terms of the initial and final positions. So remember, delta anything is final minus initial, so I can actually rewrite this as final position in the x direction minus the initial position in the x direction. That's going to equal the initial velocity in the x direction times time plus one half times the acceleration in the x direction times time squared. And it still doesn't quite match my second kinematic equation in order to do that, I will just have to add the variable x0 to both sides, my initial position. Now I have this solved for final position equals initial position plus v, the initial velocity in the x direction times time, plus one half the acceleration in the x direction times the time squared. And there is kinematic equation number two. All right. Um, I'm going to call it there for this video. In the next video, I'll show you where kinematic equation number three comes from. We're actually not going to use a graph for that. We're going to use these two kinematic equations, the first two kinematic equations, in order to derive the third. And then I'll tell you why.
we actually have three different kinematic equations. What's the point of having three different ones? And we'll cover that in the next video.